Well, welcome. Welcome back and welcome here uh, for our second uh, round of our parenting group, our True Insight Parenting Strategies. Um, so we, we talked last week about um, adult attachment styles and our roots and our, our past impacts are, are present in terms of, of our parenting. And I'm going to kind of uh, fill you in on a little bit of what we're going to do over the, the coming weeks. Um, so this, this first section, we have, we have four main sections that we're going to look at. Uh, the whole first uh, part of this is, is all about knowing yourself and how the better you know yourself, uh, the, the better you can parent. The better you know kind of your own history, your own triggers, your past, the way you do relationship, the way you attach to other people, um, the, the, the more aware you are of how you are interacting with, with your own child. Um, tonight, we're, we're going to stay... We're going to stay in that, uh, that area of understanding yourself. Um, but now we're going to look at the, the brain, the nervous system, and uh, kind of how to stop as things start to escalate, which which they do. Um, so from, from the parent side of this, um, we, our kids escalate, but we're, we're people as well. And we have the same basic mechanics that our kids do and vice versa. So getting a, a little bit of an understanding, first of all, with ourselves, Kind of taking some some stock of, of what it feels like, what it looks like, as as we start to feel stress, and kind of how the body and the brain and the nervous system process stress, so that you can be more aware of it and in touch with it as it's happening, so that you can kind of learn to to regulate well. Um, because what our kids need um, most of the time when they're in a tough spot is they need a grown up around who's regulated. They need a grown up around who is is. Uh, under control and, and is able to think clearly and be able to help them with problem solving. Now, it doesn't mean we're not going to feel feelings and feel emotions and feel triggers. All that stuff is going to happen. Um, but knowing what is going to tip us over, what's going to send us over the edge, and what that feels like as it's happening is going to give us kind of a head start. And, and we can start <coughs> that be, being the big people that we are. Um, take control of ourselves and, and start that, that regulation process um, because what they're, they're finding is that a brain kind of needs another brain in order to regulate a lot of the time. So our, our little ones, if they're feeling out of control and their grown-up is out of control, it just feeds upon each other and it, and it escalates and it fuels the fire and neither of us are thinking very clearly and neither of us are, are able to kind of control our emotions to that point. So if, if the grown-ups can can learn a little bit more about their bodies and their nervous system and, and how they, they respond under stress, um, we can start that process of, of regulation. And the good news is is that we have a little more hardware than our kiddos do. And, and we've got a little bit more in our corner in terms of the ability to regulate. Welcome, guys. Come on in. And we'll, we'll get some clues as to how that works. So this is this is kind of what we're covering tonight, is the brain, the nervous system, and call this how to stop, how to stop the process of escalation once, once it's started. Um, the weeks to come, um, so that that's just our first, our first uh, section is understanding yourself. The second section is all about understanding your child. So we start by taking a look at ourselves. Then the next part is, is taking a look at our children and what's unique about the developing child. What's unique about the brain of a child? What's unique about the experience of the child and how they're developing attachment and, and they're, they're building the building blocks of relationship they're going to take with them for the rest of their lives. And so we're, we're going to pay attention to what that looks like in, in the child in the, second, um, in the second section in the weeks to come. Um, after that, we're going to look at um, how to connect to problem solving. So after we get a good look at ourselves and a good look at our kids and we have these great tools, we're going to find out what to do when those tools don't work. And when we hit a crisis, we hit an emergency, and um, ways to connect with our children through the process of solving problems. So just, just solving problems, just fixing an emergency, just working through a crisis with a child done in the right way can actually build relationship with your child, which is, is pretty exciting. Um, and that the last section is what I call it how to connect through play. And this is how to have intentional moments with your child, how to build those into kind of the, the rhythms of life so that um, you, you do learn 
to take those golden moments when you have them. And, and some things that you can do as a parent to ensure that that's going to happen. And it looks a little different depending on how old the child is. And so we're going to look at some strategies for our very youngest children up through adolescence and, and the teen years. And kind of how connecting with our children through play looks different as, as our children um, develop and as they become older. So tonight, like I said, we're back on, on understanding yourself, uh, the second part of this, with, which is uh, the brain and the nervous system and how to stop. Um, so to, to get this started, I wanted to tell you guys a little story. Um, and this is a self-disclosure self story here. This is about little Corey. When, when Corey was little, I mean, I'm trying to think of how old I was. I must have been elementary age. Um, old enough to know better, so I'll, I'll put it that, that way. That's how old I was. And I remember my, um, I was old enough, my, my parents uh, could, could leave me at home by myself, they thought, for, for a little while. And uh, so I remember my brother and I, my little brother, were at, at our house. And um, dad drove away to go run an errand. And, and I remember um, thinking, oh, like, I want to do something really fun today. I'd like to do something really exciting. So, so I go into to the garage, and I find some cans of paint. I'm thinking, oh, this looks like a lot of fun. And, and I was a kid, so I didn't really know how to, how to get a paint can open. So I did the best I could. I kind of hit it with a, a baseball bat until it opened. Um, which, if you've ever tried to open a can of paint with a baseball bat, it's not very easy. So I, I had some level of skill here in, in doing this. And, uh, but I also managed to get paint over the baseball bat and the surrounding area and the wall of the garage. Um, and I was thinking, oh, wow, that, that, there's already paint on the wall of the garage here. Maybe I should just go ahead and, and paint the garage. That would be a really fun activity today. So I start, you know, painting, painting the garage, and 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 I'm, you know, getting paint all over everything. My, my little red wagon was there, and I think I hit that with the paint. I was like, oh, well, maybe I could paint that also. So I'm painting my wagon, and I'm I'm thinking, boy, I, I've done something really great here. Aren't my parents going to be so thrilled when they come home and see, you know, that I painted my wagon, that I painted the wall of the garage, and, and I came home, and um, that was not the reaction that I got from, from my parents. And I remember at that moment realizing that grown-ups had emotions. Because the emotions that I saw were very, very strong, and they were not very happy. And I remember seeing my dad, and his face looked different than it ever really had. And his breathing was, was different than, than it usually was. And his eyes looked really big and looked different than they usually were. And I'm thinking, something's up with Dad here. And not quite sure what it is, but it doesn't look good. And I remember as, as a kid thinking, wow, here's, here's my growing up. Um, man, was I trying to be you know, naughty? Was I trying to be mischievous? No, not really. Um, but I'd done something that was really triggering to my dad. I'd done something that, that caused him to, what I'll explain later, is he flipped his lid. There were some things happening in his body, some things happening in his nervous system that, um, that got him a little bit off of a baseline. So fast forward, so now I'm, I'm a dad myself. I've got two lovely children. My youngest just turned 11 uh, yesterday, and uh, my oldest is about to turn 13. And, um, and, and, you know, I've got rules and expectations in, in my household. Um, and I have things that I'm, I'm kind of okay with, with, you know, letting slide. And some things that, for whatever reason, just really bug me. Can I say that? Kitchen parent, can I say I get bugged sometimes? I do. Boy, I, I'm a human being. And there are things that happen sometimes that, that cause me to maybe do some of the things that maybe I saw my dad do when I was that little boy. Um, and one of the things is, is uh, I don't know why this is weird to me, but like I, um, like cleaning dishes is important to me for some reason. Like I really like when the, the, the dishes are clean. And I like, I'm, I kind of like doing it myself. I just like, I like it when, when there's a dish that it gets put away and when the dishes, dishwasher's done and it's, you know, your time to do the, the dishes that you take them out and put them away. Now with, with one of my children, um, this is really challenging. And I find myself asking, hey, go do the dishes. And he's 
your turn to do the dishes. This is your part of being a family. This is the part of you pitching in. Okay, Dad, okay, Dad. And I go, and she goes and starts, and I, I wander by, and I notice what's not done. She's, she, she started, but hasn't finished yet. And I say, I remind her, okay, kiddo, remember, we just let you know that, that this is your time to do the dishes. This is what's going on here. This is, I'm expecting you to do this. Um, okay, Dad, okay, Dad. And then I walk away, and I walk back, and guess what's still not done? The dishes sometimes I've, I found myself asking once, twice, three times, and on the third time, how am I, am I seeming at this point to my kiddo, you think? Daddy. Yeah, and, and, it's, and I'm starting to get a little frustrated, right? And I'm not, I'm not quite feeling as kind and loving, and sometimes my voice sounds different than it did the very first time I asked. And sometimes my breathing gets a little different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I start telling myself things in my head. Mm -hmm. And I start getting at the, oh my goodness, you know, this lack of respect, this lack of follow through, this, and I start going through these things and I just start to kind of escalate. And I start to kind of build. For me, that's a, <clears throat> that's a trigger. That's what we call a trigger. When my dad came home and saw the paint all over the garage and the wagon and, the, and everything, that was a trigger. Boy, something happened, snapped. He was he was emotional really quickly. For me, having to ask for something to be done again and again and again, it was a trigger in that moment. And and uh, we'll, I'll tell you how that story ends a little later. Maybe not even tonight. Maybe another week later we get to that. But there's a good ending. But the beginning is tough. The beginning is hard. And, and I say that story just to let us know, we, we, we all have triggers. Um, for some of you, the, the dishes thing wouldn't bug you at all. It's like, okay, there it is, yeah, go back to do the dishes. Um, but, but there are other things that, that do. So for our, our first activity tonight, what I'd like for you to do is uh, look on activity one, I think it's on page eight, the activity page for tonight. Page eight. Yes, perfect. So page eight. Um, everyone have their, their handouts? So, so take a few minutes and just write down what are your tongue triggers? What are things that, that bug you? Things that, that bug the pens? Hey, Lori, could you grab a couple of pens? Yeah. Sorry, Lori. Thank you, Lori. Things where you start to notice you're feeling emotional. Things that you notice your heart starting to be a little faster. Maybe your head is starting to pound a little bit. You start going through the mental dialogue like I talked about. Things that are triggers. Specifically with, with your kids, if you have kids, or with kids in general, or if you're not around kids yet, this can be stuff that's interpersonal. Things that are relationship-based, friend-based, partner, spouse. Alright, so just just by taking a few minutes to do this, I want to congratulate you because you're already ahead of the game here. But most of the time, triggers by, by nature are not something that are, are terribly conscious. They're not usually in the front of our mind. They're usually things that happen to us, and we react to, to triggers. So even just taking some time to think about what it is that, that bugs you, what it is that sets you off, gives you that much of a warning time, and that much more of a awareness that, that something may be coming. And, and it gives you a little bit more lead-in time to be proactive rather than, than reactive with these situations when, when they come. Um, so add, add to these lists when you notice these things happening. Um, think about you know, what it is, what's the situation, when is it happening, where is it happening, who is it happening with, um, and, and kind of compile a good list. And, uh, and we'll, get to, we'll get to some why as, as well. Um, so this, we're going to come back to this as well as we, we go through this, because these triggers are kind of where it starts. I've got a little video that I'm going to show to kind of bridge 
uh, the gap between last week and this week. Now, last week we talked about attachment styles. So um, for those of you that, that weren't here, just a quick review is that we, we all have things from our past that impact how we do relationship. And in our past, we, we use the analogy of like the roots and, and the leaves on the tree. The roots are like our past. Leaves that we, we can't change. They're there that are within us. And, and the leaves are the kind of the present, like the behaviors, things that we do right now. And uh, kind of being aware, taking stock of, of how we do a relationship, thinking about how we were parented, our early relationships, our formidable relationships, things that are important to us, um, impacts how we interact with our kids. So this is a video from uh, a group called Circle of Security, a, a whole program that's just fantastic. Um, but their video it was uh, shared with me at, at one of the, the trainings I went to Portland State uh, this past year. Um, this is a really good analogy and an example of being aware of when your feelings are triggered by feelings that you see in, in your kids. So we'll watch this together. <laughs> Parents. Throughout history, we've struggled to get it right. We hope we won't pass on our emotional issues to our kids, and we swear we won't make the same mistakes our parents did. We all have great intentions, but something seems to get in the way. Let's look at what that might be. At Circle of Security Parenting, we believe that being emotionally available to our children in their needs is the key to doing our best as parents. We call emotional availability being with. It means teaching emotional intelligence by being with our children in all their feelings, like sadness, joy, anger, curiosity, pain, frustration, excitement, and so on. Being with children helps them understand, trust, and move on from feelings. And knowing someone is with them in their feelings helps children feel less overwhelmed and more secure. Decades of research backs this up. For parents, some of this comes easily, but other times our children express emotions that make us uncomfortable. So we pull away or try to overrule their feelings, which leaves them on their own. We do this because our children's feelings can trigger strong emotions in us. We think of it like this. Our history during childhood of how core people responded to our different emotions creates the background music for how we experience our children's feelings. Let's look at this example. This girl and her father have been enjoying time together in the park, but suddenly aware of the time, Dad says, we need to go. When the girl hears this, she starts crying and gets increasingly angry. All at once, the dad's background music changes. The background music that is playing for the father right now, we call shark music. As it turns out, the dad's own mother was uncomfortable with loud displays of emotion, and she didn't know how to handle them. So throughout his childhood, she repeatedly told her son it was pathetic to cry, and she never ever asked him about his feelings of sadness or anger. His ability to deal with his daughter's emotion now is greatly affected by the experience with his mother then. Shark music. We're rarely aware it's playing, but it's our past experiences telling us to be afraid of or uncomfortable with a feeling or need that is actually safe. When our shark music limits our ability to respond to these feelings, our children learn to hide or feel ashamed of them. This is a problem because we're teaching our children to fear emotions that are actually both safe and essential in life. Most of us experience shark music with one emotion or another, and it's different for everyone. But whenever it is triggered, our ability to respond to our children's needs is limited. The good news is, by simply calling it by name and reflecting on what our children need in the moment, we can turn down our shark music. This is so important, because if we can learn to manage our history of negative experiences and perceptions, we can respond to the truth of our child's current situation and be with them in it. Ultimately, this will help our children grow up with a better ability to understand and share more of the emotions they experience. There's no escaping it. Strong feelings are a challenge to manage as parents, 
but our children always benefit when we have an accurate response to what's happening, rather than reacting to the sharp music we're bringing into the relationship. Remember, there's no such thing as perfect parenting, and blame never helped anyone feel more secure. That includes blaming ourselves. But the more often we can identify our shark music, the better off our children will be. What did you guys think of that? Any thoughts, reflections? Anyone relate? Yeah. And I like it, just the analogy of the shark music. Mm -hmm. The jaws coming into water, you know, and recognizing when those feelings are coming on and paying attention to it and saying, hey, that's a feeling. That, that's an emotion that comes from somewhere. And like we talked about last week, our history shapes a lot of that. A lot of those feelings come from there. Um, so, so we're going to kind of leave the history behind us at this point, and we're going to jump into the present, uh, because that's that's where we are in, in the moment. When our feelings happen, they start uh, with our experiences in the, in the past, and then it, it shapes how we're dealing with, with the here and now. So if you hold on tight, we're going to do some, some biology lessons tonight. We're going to look at, at kind of the brain and the nervous system and how it impacts our, our feelings and, uh, and how it's impacted by our feelings as well. And it all starts right here. This is a nerve cell. This is a neuron. This is, these are in our body, all throughout our body, and they're active pretty much all the time. Um, there's, there's a few parts of it. There's the, uh, the, the dendrites, the little branches, and there's these, uh, they call the axon. It's like a little wire that, that goes, and some of them are really long. Some of our, our nerve cells are super long, and there's huge clusters of them throughout our body in specific places. Our brain cells, lots and lots of neural connections uh, within our brains, and there's also, they found some, some clusters of nerve cells in our heart and our lungs and in our gut and bowels. And, and, um, but this is where all kind of thought and reaction starts. This is where all of our perception of the world around us starts. Um, and they don't happen by themselves. There are genes of these, um, and they they start to do um, they start to, to fire. So so this this one right here is going to get a message from one of your sensory organs, could be your eyes or your ears, your nose, your mouth. Some something is getting some information from the world around you, and it's processing it really really fast, and it's going to shoot a signal from this one to, to this one. It's going to jump a little gap there, and there's these neuroreceptors that go from one to the next to the next, and then this one's going to fire to the next one, and it's, and it's going to move um, uh, uh, throughout your body. Now, in your brain, these are really, really complicated. They're really complex, and they're, they're chains of them start forming um, almost the moment we're born. Even that the attachment process that we talked about when the baby is you know, it cries and its mother comes to soothe it. Um, there are neural connections that happen in the brain that says, "Hey, when you do this, um, this is what's going to happen next." And there's a, Dan Siegel talks about this this process of firing together, and he says, "What fires together, wires together, and and survives together." So when you have these experiences happen again and again and again, you start to develop these really cool pathways in your brain. That, and this is, this is how learning happens. You learn who your, your family is, you learn your neighborhood, you learn your preschool friends, you learn your colors, you learn your shapes. All of this starts happening through the process of, of wiring together, firing together, surviving together. Um, it's the basis of, of all of our kind of input information into the body. Um, so there's these electrical sorts of, of things that are happening that will, will impact the body, especially under stress. Um, there are, are two different uh, nervous systems, uh, the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system within your body. And there's some notes on that. 
on your page to talk about that place to write about this. Here, I'm going to try to make this super easy for you. So the the uh, sympathetic nervous system. This is when all of those those nerve cells in your body start sending messages to your brain that you need to respond to something around you. Something's happening that you need to respond. Sympathetic is like a race car at the beginning of the starting line and it's ready to just peel out and, and shoot into action. The, the sympathetic nervous system, um, it, it sends your body into react mode. This is where your fight or flight response comes from. Um, and, and it does some things to your body. It dilates your pupils, it, it uh, inhibits the flow of saliva, it accelerates your heartbeat, um, it dilates your, your bronchi and your lungs. So it's, it's basically everything you need to, to fight. It's getting your body ready for that. So your pupils dilate, you get this kind of pinpoint accuracy on what's right in front of you. Your heart's beating faster, getting more blood to your extremities and to your muscles because you're either gonna have to fight your way through this, you're gonna have to run away really fast. Your, your lungs start to take these, these shallower sorts of breaths, saying, okay, let's just get lots and lots of oxygen really, really fast. And, and your body is, is on high alert. So that feeling, uh, the, those things that I saw in my dad when I was little, and he was coming home and he was really, really angry, his body was starting to react in an angry way because he was triggered by what he saw and his body started to, to respond to what was happening there. So um, so this is, and this is a good thing. You know, this is kind of what helps us survive as a people, is having a sympathetic nervous system response. So like if I was out on the, on the, the street up here in front of the, the church building and, and I was standing in the middle of the street and, a, and I saw a car coming at me really fast, um, I would need my sympathetic nervous system to, to give me a burst of get out of here, uh, to, to respond quickly and dart out of the road so I don't get hit. That's a good thing. If I'm, I'm walking through the jungle and a tiger starts chasing me, I need my sympathetic nervous system to say, okay, do I need to fight? Do I need to run? What do I need to do to, to survive? Um, but what it, what it doesn't do well is, is uh, help you think really clearly and problem solve. Because you're in survival mode when, when your sympathetic nervous system is online. You're, you're, not, uh, you're not thinking very clearly. Well, thankfully, we don't live like that all the time. Or hopefully we don't. Some people it feels like we do, but for most of us, um, you know, the sympathetic nervous system physically can't uh, can't last forever. You know, the body gets depleted at some point, and this is where chronic stress becomes a real health issue. This is when uh, we're we're kind of constantly in fight or flight sort of mode. So we need something else to come help us cool down. And this is the the parasympathetic nervous system. It's the, the parachute that's on your your page there kind of reminds you that. It slows everything down. Think about someone just floating through the air on a parachute. It, it, all of those things that the sympathetic does, the, the parasympathetic does the opposite. So you know, your heart starts to slow, and your breathing becomes more deep and more measured. Your eyes um, it constrict. It stimulates the flow of the, so the saliva in your mouth. So if you've ever been nervous, like public speaking, and, and your mouth gets really dry, that's your sympathetic nervous system kicking in the gear, saying, hey, there's more stress than you're used to being under right now. And then once you're, you're, it's over with, and you're like, oh, well, I, can, I can talk again. Like I feel my mouth and I can feel my tongue. Then, then that's your parasympathetic. It's giving the all clear, saying, hey, there's nothing to worry about here. Now what we thought was, was going to be a stress is no longer a stress. You are no longer under attack. So you can let your body kind of relax right now. Getting in touch with our parasympathetic nervous system is can be a very, very good thing. And it happens automatically, uh, but we can we can do some things to kind of help it head that direction. Um, when, when our brain is telling us, and our brain stem is giving this message saying fight or flight, and our breathing gets really shallow and our heart starts to race and you get that thumping in your head, um, that's the blood flow that's the oxygen that, that you're trying to get really fast. So the whole like take a deep breath when you're angry, that is, is getting your, your parasympathetic nervous system back online. That's, that's getting a message to your body, all is clear, all is safe. And they've even found like your, 
So when you when your 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 sympathetic nervous system is firing, you get clenched fists as well. So what does this look like? You're ready to fight, right? It's your body saying, okay, get these ready. Spreading out your hands when you're under stress, they found starts the, the, the uh, parasympathetic nervous response to, to start happening. So if you, if you ever feel that way, if you're under a lot of stress, I just took my big national counseling exam this past week and I, I found myself doing that. I was, I was clenched. I mean, I was like really, really stressed. And at one point I was like, okay, I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to get my hands open wide here. My hands kind of open this open, sort of receding kind of posture. Nice. Like imagine yourself kind of receiving peace and receiving that, uh, that, that tranquility that you need to get your body back under control. And, and it kind of, it, it's like the, the automatic pilot in a plane. You know what I'm talking about? Like how you know, the planes have those things and you push the button and it just kind of flies. So that's like your your sympathetic nervous system is is like that autopilot saying okay, and and you see that you know we're about to head into the side of the mountain here. We got to we got to change course. Um, so you're going to take control. You're going to take the manual controls back of that airplane, and you're going to steer it back into safety and back into peace. When when you're when you take deep breaths, you're back on manual control. You're choosing to breathe choosing to breathe slowly. When you when you notice that your hands are clenched and, and you and you open them up, that's that's putting your brain back on manual control. Saying, so hey, I think we got this. I think we're gonna survive. I think we're gonna be okay. Um, this is my child I'm dealing with here, not a tiger in the jungle. Right? This is you know I get the fight or flight, but I think I'm gonna be okay here. So so doing some things to get in, get your parasympathetic firing and doing what it's supposed to do to calm your body down is, is one of the first great steps to, to take. So that's that's all electric. There's like the, the and they call this like the, the hot cycle because it's really fast. You know, sympathetic, parasympathetic is, is a very quick response with, within the brain and within the body. It starts in the limbic region and, and kind of flows through through the rest of your body, but it's and it's electric. So it's almost like an on-off sort of switch. The other cycle is the endocrine system. This is the, the chemical cycle, or we call this like the slow cycle. The, the chemical cycle is, is the hormones that are released when you're under stress. When you're under, when you're under stress, your fight hormone is your adrenaline. You ever had a legit like, adrenaline experience? They're pretty intense. You know, it's, it's, you, these, you, that's the kind of thing where you hear about people like ripping car doors off of the vehicle and pull out the child that's inside, or you know, these superhuman feats of strength. They, they really happen. I mean, you're, you're, that adrenaline is an amazing chemical that, that allows you to do the, the impossible for this much time. You know, it's like you get through that, that immediate um, situation, and then a lot of times you feel sick. It goes to your gut, and you're like, oh, I'm so depleted, I'm ready to crash. Because your body physically can't do the adrenaline response for very long periods of time. It just, it just can't. Uh, the body and the heart and the, the whole, you know, your body systems aren't built to, to be able to live under that capacity. But it, it happens. So it's a chemical and, it, and then it kind of sticks around. There's some residual that kind of stays in your body and floats around. Cortisol is your stress hormone. So adrenaline is your, is your fight response. Cortisol is your stress response. Cortisol is that little burst of, I can do it. If you're in a stressful situation, it may not be necessarily fight or flight. It may feel like it, though. It's your body's under stress of some, of some sort. And your brain releases this chemical um, called cortisol that, that helps you be able to get through that moment, get to that moment well. So when, it's, when your body needs it, it's a good, good thing. You know, it's a good thing to be able to get a burst of cortisol to get you through what you didn't think you could get through. Um, but there again, cortisol, under long amounts of time, becomes toxic to your body systems. And it's linked to things like um, obesity, and it's linked to heart problems, and I mean, it's, it, there's all these, and it can be toxic to the brain. And even when, when there's, your body's flooded with cortisol, uh, you don't make new memories well. 
developmental pediatrician talk to us about the, uh, the cortisol response in, in children who are under chronic stress. This is why it's hard to learn when you come from an environment where there's chronic stress. It's hard to learn in school when you have stress at, at home all the time. And part of that is biochemicals. The cortisol doesn't allow for, for new memories to form very well. Um, this is also why when uh, we don't learn our lesson necessarily sometimes when we're in the heat of the moment. We're not, we're not processing on a very uh, cognitive sort of level. Cortisol has a half-life of, I think it's eight hours, which means in eight hours, half of, or, sorry, two hours, so um, in two hours, half of it's gone. In the next two hours, another half is gone. In the next two hours, another half is gone. And the whole cycle takes about eight hours to, 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 for cortisol to completely leave your system. So when you've experienced a really stressful situation and your body gives you this big burst of cortisol, um, it, it kind of lingers. Whereas your, your nervous system, it's on or off. And you've got your sympathetic, your parasympathetic, and it kind of calms down pretty quickly. Uh, the, the chemical effects of stress on our body are a little more long-lasting. That's why if we have a, you know, a huge argument uh, before we go to work, our work day may really, really suffer because we may have some of that residual cortisol in our body that keeps this kind of amped up. This is why kids, when they get in a fight, you know, right at, right off the school bus, their whole day a lot of times they're just blown out of the water because they're, they're, that cortisol is still kind of floating around uh, in, their, in their bodies. Um, in the body, you know, it wants cortisol when it wants it, but it doesn't want it when there's too much. And, and as a matter of fact, the brain even has kind of this process where if you have constant cortisol being pumped through your body, your brain eventually says enough is enough, and it kind of turns off the, the faucet, so to speak. And it's like no more cortisol because it's killing you, <laughs> and it's and it's wrecking your brain and wrecking your body. So so we're gonna your you, and your cortisol levels are kind of depleted at that point, which is really not good because then the next time you're in a stressful situation and you have no cortisol, you don't have that burst of I can do it like maybe the next person does that's sitting next to you. And, and so chronic stress all the time has a biochemical impact on, on the body. All right. So this is the kind of the nervous system. This is the endocrine system. The chemical system in the body. The electrical system in the body. I'm going to talk for just a moment about the vagal nerve also. Has anyone ever heard of the vagal nerve? Yeah, they're finding out more and more about it. It's super, super interesting. Um, so this is just kind of to let you know how connected your body is and, and how connected it is to the stress that you experience. So the vagal nerve actually starts up in the roof of your mouth. It goes up, up into your, your brain, to your like limbic region of your brain, the emotional centers of your brain. And then it goes down through and it, and it connects your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, your stomach, your gut, your intestines, um, and and it's there's so there's this kind of whole body um, reaction that happens a lot of times during stress, and, and the the vagal nerve it's so it's not just you know lots of chains and the vagal nerve is actually one continuous nerve that connects all of those. So when you feel kind of that, that stress, some people will feel it kind of at different places. If you're kind of a head stress sort of person, it could be that that's where kind of stress kind of collects for you. And some people feel it in their heart, you'll feel it in their breathing, in their lungs, some people feel it in their gut. Um, but there is a, a kind of continuous response to stress that the vagal nerve uh, will, will send all throughout the body. Um, interestingly, they, so it's, you know, it starts in the roof of your mouth, so, so soothing in the roof of your mouth actually can help to, to calm the vagal nerve. So we think about babies, what do they do? Mm -hmm. Thumb, pressure, even like the, the nursing. And so, so even for us grown-ups, if, if uh, we're under an awful lot of stress, sometimes just getting some pressure, or sometimes a hard candy, or a Tootsie Pop is perfect. It's, it's like right in the roof of your mouth there. Um, something that, that, that kind of will, 
will stimulate um, that, that pale nerve uh, response can, can, uh, can be kind of soothing, so something kind of helps out. And one of the ladies, uh, Karen Purvis, that uh, came up with the trust-based relational interventions we talked a little bit about last week. Um, she actually, she works primarily with kids out of foster care and, and adoption. And she keeps um, Tootsie Pops and, and, and suckers with her uh, most of the time when she's working with kids for that reason is, is the, the soothing of the vagal nerve. It's not because, hey, here kid, have some sugar, have a lollipop. It's she knows that the biology of it and sometimes just a little bit of kind of self-soothing is enough to, to kind of help, help out with that. So thinking about that, you know, when, when you're feeling triggered, when you're feeling emotional, um, you can give yourself a little bit of a break. I mean, part of this is just your biology, and your nervous system, your, your your biochemical factories in your body, your vagal nerve, um, you were designed to react to stressful situations. There's, there's, there are functions in your body that are, are perfect for dealing with, with stress. Part of who we are. That's just, that's just the body part. We haven't even got to the brain. Mm -hmm. The brain is super fascinating. Um, they they are, are learning more and more about the brain all the time, and the best experts that there are talk about how vast the information is that we still don't know. And it is a remarkable, remarkable organ, and it's an organ that stores history. Think about that. It's it's pretty well like an organ in your body that's that's there to to store the history that you've experienced. And it stores your emotions. And it reacts to, to the world around you constantly. And they used to think that you had this kind of finite number of brain cells. And it's kind of use them or lose them. And, and if you lose them, they're gone. And, and, and if you don't use them well in your life, and then you're, you're kind of sunk. Um, but what they're finding is that uh, the brain's plasticity which means its ability to, to grow and flex and change um, is, is way more than we ever thought. And that, and that the brain is capable of change and growth throughout the lifespan. Throughout the lifespan. Now it's a little more plastic and a little more flexible when we're younger because we're just, you know, we're taking in so much more information. Um, but, but the brain has an amazing ability to, to reroute itself, to, to heal itself, to change course, um, to find the, you know, these narrow pathways and things that we've always done it this way, and that's just how we do it, um, through practice and through change and through in, in, intentional processes, we can actually change the wiring of our brain. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's good news to me, the, that our brains can actually change. It's good news for our kids, too. Know that our kids, uh, there are some parts of the brains that they really, really can change. So if they've had a rough go of things, if they've experienced trauma, if they've experienced abuse, if they've experienced neglect, if they've experienced natural disasters, if they've experienced dog bites, and all sorts of things that they've experienced um, that that will lead to certain kinds of behavioral responses, that those things can actually change. Um, like I said, for us, it's, it's a little, little trickier, a little harder, but it can be done. So I'm going to let you know, here's a, here's a, a video that's going to explain kind of the, the main parts of, of the brain. Now, you probably know the name Dan Siegel. He's one of the giants in the field of interpersonal neurobiology. And Dan came up with a lovely hand model of the human brain. So let's kind of go through the hand model of the brain. And this can be useful for you to understand, but at times it might be useful for you to actually share this with your client. The wrist, the forearm coming up to here is like your spinal cord. And 
right here at the uh, the end of the wrist is like the base of your skull and here the bottom of your palm this is like the reptile brain the life support system of the brain so you know if the rest of your brain is wiped out through say for example a stroke or a car accident this life support part of your brain the reptile brain can still keep your body alive can still keep all your organs functioning and your breath and your heart and so forth and this is where a lot of autonomic nervous system operates and stems from this reptile brain. Now, above the reptile brain is the mammalian brain, often called the limbic brain or the emotional brain. So reptiles, they've got the fight or flight response or they've got the freeze, shut down, flop and drop response, but they don't really have anything that is even remotely close to the, the complex emotional states that we see in mammals. And the limbic brain has many different parts to it, but two in particular that we'll be looking at in this course are the amygdala and the hippocampus. Now, don't worry about memorizing those terms for now. We will revisit them later. But this kind of is the, the middle brain, the limbic brain, the mammalian brain, basically responsible for emotions. Now, on top of the limbic mammalian emotional brain, you've got the cerebral cortex, the thinking cap of the brain. The cerebral cortex is much thicker in mammals, but is especially so in primates and particularly so in human beings more so than any other primate. And this cerebral cortex, the thinking part of the brain responsible for consciousness and cognition. And right at the front of the cerebral cortex, you have the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right up here at the front of your forehead, above your eyes. And particularly important to us is the medial prefrontal cortex, this bit in the middle right at the front, this bit up here. This plays a very important role in mindfulness and awareness. So let's just go through it again. You've got your spinal cord, you've got your reptile brain, underneath your cerebral cortex you've got your mammalian brain with the amygdala or the hippocampus responsible for emotions, and then you've got your cerebral cortex, your thinking cap of the brain on top, and the medial prefrontal cortex right here in the center at the front, right there. so complex. A lot of words. Here, here's the main thing I want you to remember from that though. Just think, think upstairs and downstairs. Our upstairs brain is our thinking brain. It's our problem solver, our wise leader. This is where we're thought, rational thinking, logical thinking it happens is in our, our frontal lobe. It's, it's good for that. Our downstairs brain is our feeling brain. This is our, our limbic system. So, so the hand model um, this part inside here is the limbic system. This is our downstairs brain. And this part up here is, is our, our upstairs brain, our, our cortex. Um, and, and this is where the thinking happens. The so thinking, feeling. Problem solving, emotion. Now, Dan Siegel, when he uses this, this model, he shows that sometimes what happens is when, when we're, uh, we're experiencing a situation the, the limbic system or the downstairs becomes so overloaded, so stressed, so angry, so frustrated, so sad, that he does what we call flipping our lid, right? When this is overwhelmed, we, we lose touch with our thinker. We lose touch with rational thought, and all we're left with is emotion, right? which is, is not always the greatest place to be. As parents, we need to recognize when we've flipped our lids. If you recognize I'm here, I'm completely in my feeling brain, um, you need to take some steps to, to get your frontal lobe back down. This is where some of the deep breaths, some of the mindfulness, um, this is where if you can tell your story to someone else and they listen to you, and they hear you, you feel felt, and you feel known, and, and there's a, a neurotransmitter called GABA that gets released. And its whole job is to calm down the, the limbic system and allow you to get back in touch with, with your frontal cortex. So if you have people that you talk to, a friend, a spouse, 
someone that, that you can share what's what's going on. That's a great way to kind of help your, your limbic system to, to calm and soothe. But this is also true for our kiddos. And we'll talk about this more with, with the kids section. But our kids flip their lids. And when they're stuck in emotional brain, what they don't need is a whole lot of logic. What, what they need is to be felt and, and they need to be known. And that process will get them to the point where they can get logical again and where they can hear about consequences. They can hear the, the lesson that, that you're trying to teach at that point. But with, with when our frontal lobe is offline, we're, we're kind of stuck. So upstairs, thinker. Downstairs, feeler. Upstairs, problem solver. Downstairs, emotion central. Within the, the downstairs brain in the, the limbic region, um, I'm going to walk you through how, how this actually works. I'm going to tell you a little story about our, our three characters here in the limbic region. Um, so he, he talked about the big long names, and you don't need to really remember those. Um, the, the thalamus is one of those, but we just call him Mr. T. So in your limbic system is where Mr. T lives. And his whole job is to pay attention to sensory information. So everything gets filtered through. All the sensory is coming through through the thalamus. Um, because that's his whole job is just to kind of filter, hey, what's going on here? And most of the time he's fine, right? Because we're used to most of the things in our lives. Anyone had driven home and you got there and you're like, how did I get here? because you weren't stressed, you've done it a thousand times, and your brain kind of went on autopilot, and everything was, was just fine. Now, if you were driving home, same way you always do, and, and all of a sudden, um, you know, there's a giant fire in the middle of the road, or there's a vehicle that's overturned, and there's ambulances everywhere. Mr. T's gonna pay attention to that. He's gonna say, something's different here. Um, we need to do something. We need to figure something out. So. He'll, he'll check in with the, so there's the hippocampus, and we call that the, the hippie campus, because we're in Eugene and we just kind of roll that way. But I think about the hip, hippie campus, kind of like this big place, it's like a library, there's lots of books, and this is all our, kind of our, our long-term memories, and these are our things, so, so your, your root home is in your hippie campus, you know, and that's why you're fine most of the time, because it's, it's always there, you just kind of flow through it. Um, but if you see something, if you see the big fire and the overturned car and the lights and the ambulance, um, he's going to check and say, hey, is this normal? Is this the way things usually are? And it's going to go into your memory. And it's going to say, no, this is not the way things usually are. And it might even pull another show, book off the shelf and it's going to say, oh, when there's fire and there's ambulances, something bad has happened. And, and that's what, you know, you have a frame of reference for it. Your brain is doing this all the time. Everything you see, everything you experience, you're, you're, and it's just so fast. And then it's going to go to your, your amygdala, who we call her Amy. So Mr. T takes in your information, he checks it out in the hippie campus. Is this something we need to do something about? And Amy, the amygdala, is going to choose fight, flight, or freeze. Right? It's going to say, okay, there's a big fire, and do I need to like turn my car around and go the other way? Do I need to kind of barrel through the situation, or do I just put on the brakes and don't do anything? What, what do I do here? So this is, um, and this, and this is your, your feeler brain. This is your, your downstairs brain. It's constantly taking in information, sorting it out. What do I need? What do I need to do here? When you check with the long-term memory, and it says, okay, this is going to be, things are going to be okay. Situation is going to be okay. Our amygdala is going to kind of get a hug, and our, our prefrontal cortex is going to come back online. And it's going to say, "Okay, we don't need to fight, flight, or freeze here. We can we can do some problem solving and kind of get through this." So upstairs, downstairs, thinking brain, feeling brain. In our feeling brain, it's going to choose fight, flight, or freeze based on what we've we've experienced in our past and what we're experiencing right now. On our, our thinking brain, our upstairs brain, we also have, we have two halves of it. We have two brains in our head. We've got our right hemisphere and our left hemisphere. So even within our, our thinker, we have 
two different uh, ways of, of thinking. And you've, you've heard like the right brain people and left brain people, and no one's really all right brain or all left brain, but we do have some tendencies sometimes to lean a little bit in these different directions. But they, this is actually based on kind of the biology. We've done brain scans and they can show that like analytical information, language processing, uh, math, facts, they all live in the left brain. And creativity, the whole, I've seen kind of the, the, the big picture, this is like the spirit of the law lives in, in, the, in the right brain, the letter of the law lives in the left brain. So even within our, our cortex, we have our right hemisphere that's more kind of emotional, creative, and our left hemisphere that's, that's more kind of practical, more fact-driven. Depending on kind of how we're, we're built and how we respond to stress, also we, we can tend to go to extremes with within the hemispheres of our brain. And Dan Siegel calls the the left brain the, the left brain desert. When you get to the point where you're you're not you just cut yourself off from emotions, it's just the facts. That's all we're dealing with here. Is we, we sometimes what we call it our left brain desert. We're, we're stuck. Now it's very dry, void of feelings. The facts are really all we care about. Now the right brain, he calls this the right brain tsunami. When our right brain gets flooded with, with emotions and, and we're, we're, we're kind of stuck in, in feeling mode. Now ideally, what we're shooting for is, is to get an experience where we have right and left brain working together. We have the corpus callosum that goes through the middle of our brain connects our, our right and our left hemisphere. And um, when we're at our best, we need the facts and we need our emotions. To think clearly and to problem solve, to get through a stressful situation, you can't be so emotional that you can't think clearly. And you can't be so cut off from your feelings that, that you're, you're dealing with it purely based on the facts. So our, we, have, we have to kind of learn to find this balance. And you have to kind of check yourself sometimes. And, and I like just the language of this. Of am I, am I in, a, in a right brain tsunami right now? Am I so emotional that I can't think logically and I can't think rationally? Or am I so just done, so cut off, so in my left brain desert that, that I'm, I, feelings don't even matter to me? I don't care. I don't care how you feel. I don't care what's going on for you. This is, this is the facts of the situation. If we can draw from both of those, we're, we're going to be in a good spot. A lot of information, All right? Upstairs, mm -hmm. thinking, downstairs, feeling. Left brain, logic. Right brain, emotions. Kind of, kind of check your head as you're, as you're starting to feel triggered. And when I'm dealing with, um, dealing with my kiddo, and I see that the dishes aren't done after the third time that I've asked her to do them, and I start and noticing that, that I'm thinking, this should just be done, right? And I might be a little bit cut off from, from my feelings, or I could be so emotional about it. Man, I just told you, how, how many times do I have to tell you this, right? I'm so emotional that I respond overly emotionally. If I can get to a place, if I can recognize where, where am I leaning, Leaning right, am I leaning left? Have I flipped my lid, or can I think clearly through the situation? So, what do we do? What do we do about all of this? First of all, um, and, and I'm not going to have you do this one right now because we're, we're running a little low on time. Um, but I want you to do this as as homework. Um, preparing for a crisis starts before the crisis. So, parenting from our, our best emotional selves starts before you hit the moment of a crisis. So there's an activity there on, on page, um, activity two on page eight, um, that I want you to think about preparing. And the first one is, is surrounding yourself with support. This is who listens to you when you flip your lid? Who helps you feel known and understood so you can get back in touch with your thinking brain? Who's there that's able to call you on your stuff and say, hey, Looks like maybe you need to take some, some deep breaths. Maybe you need to uh, take, take a break here. Tap out. I got this for a bit. 
I'm going to go work on this. You you go take a break. Who who are your support people? The people that that live in your house, your neighbor, your friend, your coworker, your spouse. Who is it that you go to? And if you don't have these people, I recommend finding these people. Parenting as a lone ranger is tough. It's a hard, hard business. So, so finding your supports, whatever that looks like to you, is, is part of how you're able to prepare for the crisis before it happens. And the second is participating in frequent and regular self-care. What are things that recharge your batteries? I put the running thing on there. Um, so it's exercise actually resets your cortisol levels. Physical exercise, it doesn't even have to be strenuous. If you go for a walk for half an hour, three times a week, that's going to put you at a place where your brain and your body are better able to handle the stress that comes your way, which is good news. Doing things, and, and it, may, it doesn't have to be physical, though. If you can build some kind of physical exercise into your rhythms of life, that's fantastic. But there are other things that help you recharge your batteries. For some people, it's going to the movies. For some people, it's getting out in nature, going for a walk, going for a hike. What, whatever it is that recharges your batteries. If you don't know what those things are, I highly recommend find out what they are and schedule them. Make time for them. You may have to call on your support people for this. You may have to say, man, I've got this thing I've got to do one time a week. Can you watch my kids for half an hour? You know, or it's kids are in daycare, they're at school or whatever, and you, you've got a thousand things that you've got to get done Take time to do the thing that's going to recharge your batteries, that's going to recharge you, that's going to put you in a place where you're better able to, to cope with the stress. It's going to, it's going to your, your sympathetic nervous system is going to be less reactive, your amygdala is going to be less reactive, your, um, the cortisol levels are going to be better. So your body, taking time to, to take care of yourself emotionally and physically it is going to help you be able to be a better parent. In a, in a place biologically where you're better off. Second thing is, is recognize the crisis and become proactive. Um, this is where we're going to throw a little bit of cognitive behavioral work at, at you, and uh, which is a bunch again of big words, which just means that our thoughts and our feelings and our actions are all connected. When you recognize that you're triggered, and you recognize that, that your kid has made you flip your lid and you're, and you're in that space where you're in an emotional brain, um, taking some time to get in touch with your, with your feelings and your thoughts will help you react more positively. And this is our, our model. I think yeah, this is on page 11. This is what we, we use over at Kafa. And it's kind of a, a, a uh, we call it the, the process of change, or we call it the stop model. Um, but this is really just a very practical way of, of getting in touch with your, your thoughts and your feelings so that you can respond more proactively with the people that you love and that you care about. Now this starts with um, where we all start with is self-value experience as feeling. We all have a sense of, of, of ourselves where we want to feel respected, accepted, valued, and controlled myself, connected, uh, belonging, Regarded, empowered, and lovable. Anyone disagree with any of those things? But those are good things, right? Those are things we, we kind of need. We need to feel loved. We need to feel kind of in control of our own situation. We need to feel respected, valued. Um, and as long as we're feeling those things, we're usually pretty okay. There's no crisis, right? Until something comes along that, that threatens one of those things, right? A problem occurs, um, insult is experienced, loss happens, and this is a threat of a failure. So, so I experience something that threatens my, my sense of self-worth, and the results are that I feel a sudden drop in my self-value. So like when I've asked my kid to do the dishes three times, and the fourth time I go in there and they're still not done, my sense of, of being in control is not happening, my sense of being valued my sense of being respected, it is, can be impacted by that. I, I asked for something to be done, and it didn't happen. 
And if I'm starting to feel disrespected or devalued by this, my self doesn't like that. And, and it has to kind of make sense of what, what's the deal here. Because I know that I'm a respectable person, and I know that I'm a valuable person, but something about this situation is threatening that sense of, of value and, and, and respect. And I, and I try to kind of blame, assign some blame for, for the situation here. Just, just My mind just starts to go in that direction. And there's an impulse to kind of protect myself. And now I can do this one of, of two ways. One of the ways is, is I start listening to those, those negative thoughts about being devalued and being disrespected and that that's kind of what, what's happening. And then I'm going to get angry. And that anger is going to lead to um, <coughs> probably some poor choices. If I lead with my anger in my, in my interaction with my kid, um, that's going to end up kind of perpetuating the idea that maybe I'm, I'm not valuable and maybe I'm not respected. Um, so we're gonna we're not gonna be in a good place together, and she's gonna experience that as as probably hurt, or embarrassment, or loss, and there may be drift that happens in our relationship if I lead with anger, and if that anger gives birth to to um, actions that are not healthy in, in our relationship. The other way of doing this is is everything we've said so far is just about awareness, recognizing. I know where I'm at, I can feel it in my body, I know my, my brain is flipped, my lid is flipped, and I'm not in a good spot right now. Um, so, to protect myself, I'm going to do what's what's called the, the stop process. And I and it's listed on here is, is uh, visualizing a stop sign or, or saying stop three times. It's, you got to do something to ground yourself. you got to get some, something to get you in reality. If you need to visualize a stop sign when you're in that angry moment you're about to do something that you're going to regret with your kid, if you can get to the point where you're saying, okay, I need to take some deep breaths, I need to take a break, you might need to visualize yourself out in the woods or at the beach, whatever you do to get yourself grounded, that's what you need to do. You may need to say the words stop in your head. It may, it may need to come to that, or visualizing something stop you in that moment. And what you're doing is you're, is you're getting your parasympathetic back and, and you're trying to get back in touch with, with your thinker rather than your feeler. And at that point, you're gonna take some time to be curious. Curiosity takes thinker, not feeler, right? Curiosity takes, um, I'm wondering what the deal is. I wonder if there is something I don't know about the situation curious what happened for her what happened for me why am I feeling so disrespected right now why am I feeling so devalued right now what about the situation this may be back to my roots a little bit this may be back to some of my past stuff so taking some time to be curious why do I feel so angry it's going to stop the process of, of, of the flipped lid and it's going to get us back to some rational thinking again so be curious about our kids' behavior. What is it that's going on there? And then opt to give yourself and others the benefit of the doubt. This is where you say, I'm a biological being and I'm responding to stress right now and I need to kind of get myself un under control. And, and you know, this, this happens and I want, I want to be my best self right now. But also thinking, I wonder what's happening for her. She's a human being also. What got in her way of doing what, what she needed to do? And then process from a place of value. So you know I am a respectable person, I am a lovable person, and, and I want to process this as that rather than an out of control, angry, frustrated dad. I, I want to I want to interact with my kid in a way that shows value to myself and, and others. So we'll we'll revisit that a little bit um, throughout the process, but it's you know, take some time, think about your roots. Think about um, your mind and your body. Is your lid flipped? Is your, are you in a desert? Are you in a tsunami? Um, keep yourself emotionally healthy. Locate your supports, your friends, your connections. Um, and be curious about your child, about your feelings and your child's feelings. Um, curiosity, it's a higher level brain functioning. Um, it, it's hard to, to stay mad when you're curious and when you're, you're getting into that problem solver sort of mode. 
So anything you can do to get yourself curious, thinking, calm, rational, um, you're going to be in a good spot to be able to do some good problem solving with, with your kiddo. So know, know yourself, know your roots, know your history, know your body, know your brain, know how it works, and you're in a really good, good place to start. All right? All right. Have a great night, guys. Thanks. Thanks.